Hello and welcome to this webinar for Sotheby's Contemporary Conversations in partnership with Intelligence Squared. I'm Will Gompertz, a uh, one-time BBC Arts editor, critic, author and soon-to-be artistic director of The Barbican. Tonight we're going to be discussing women artists um, based around a sale that Sotheby's are putting together called Women Artists, where the word women is in brackets and in a way this conversation is all about those brackets. Uh, our participants are two marinas, so <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? One curator, one an artist. Uh, the artist is, I'm delighted to say, Marina Abramovich, probably uh, the foremost performance artist ever, I would say. A, a, a fantastic uh, performer who has been working at this particular genre of art since the 70s in Belgrade coming over to Edinburgh Festival, I remember, Marina, at some stage in the 70s. Um, and then, of course, building a career, first with Ulai, then as a, a solo artist, um, and then memorably having that e exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art, The Artist is Present, where she made performances are really central to the canon and led to things like the, the extension being built at Tate Modern around the whole concept of performance art. And really, th that would not have happened without... Marina Abramovich, who is back in London in 2023 with a show at the Royal Academy, where she's been, been given the whole space, the first female artist to be given the whole space. So I've always enjoyed talking to Marina. I know we're going to enjoy talking tonight as well. So hi, Marina. How are you doing? I'm doing very fine. I'm in New York. I just came back from India, which was a real hell of the trip and happy yeah. home. Good. Well, we're delighted to have you here. Um, joining Marina is another Marina, who is uh, a senior curator at Sotheby's, curator specialist in contemporary art, who's been one of the group of curators putting together the Women, uh, women Artists sale. That is Marina Ruiz uh, Colomar. Marina, hello. How are you doing? Hello. I'm very well, thank you. Okay, so I think we should just get straight into it and get into, into the subject itself, which is the topic of gender and particularly female artists and, and what does it mean? So starting with you, Marina Abramovich, Marina A, if I may, um, what does uh, the, the word woman artist mean in the 21st century, if in fact it means anything? You know, I've been struggling with this question all my life because I've always been perceived as a female artist, but my statement is very simple and clear. I am female, I'm more female but I'm an artist, and art doesn't have gender. And I don't think it's important is a male artist, female artist, transgender, uh, you know, uh, homosexual, uh, gay artist, whoever, you know, black, white. I think it's really about, you know, art without gender. Art is the unique thing. And they only have two categories, good art, bad art, that's it. It's very important that we talk about contact and not about gender. George Martin, the Beatles' famous producer, said exactly the same about music because he, he was a classical musician who went on to produce the Beatles. And he said, there is only two types of music, which is good and bad music, exactly the same point. But I suppose, Marina, it has been a factor in your life and it's been a factor which has changed. The perception of the female artist has changed over the decades you've been working. To, to, to leave us at, which, at what point now, today? I think today is uh, the position of female artists is much better than before. I mean, they are mm. very visible in the exhibitions, in the in the in, in the in the community, in the art scene, and also, you know, the, the voice can be heard, which didn't happen before. And and Marina R, um, Marina Ruiz, should I say, the Sotheby sale that you put together with colleagues, women artists, in brackets. I mean, clearly, you're acknowledging what might be seen as an issue, but actually is, 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 is the, the, the prefix of, of, of women actually rather important in art in your mind? Um, so actually something that Marina A said uh, was so interesting because a lot of the women that we have selected and been able to include in this sale never considered themselves as 
women artists. Um, so on like Helen Frankenthaler um, never really thought of her, herself as a woman artist. She just thought of herself as an artist who was interested in paint and who was interested in her method. The same goes for Dorothea Tanning. Um, she, there's, a, there's an amazing quote from her saying something like, woman artist, there's no such thing. It's just a contradiction in terms as man artist or elephant artist. Um, so we had had this debate for quite a while. We had wanted to do something like this for a, for a while. And um, it is precisely this pigeonholing um, that women sometimes find themselves in and have found themselves in throughout history that we wanted to turn on its head. Um, and that's also the reason why we're using brackets, uh, because we think and we agree with Marina A's statement that um, it's about the art, not about the gender of the artist. And yet the, the sale is about gender. I mean, is that ironic? Very. Yeah, okay. it is. So the way this is going to the way this is going to work um, for, for viewers is we'll have this conversation with the two marinas for about 40 minutes and then we'll take your questions. So please do contribute questions um, to the question box at the bottom where it says chat. You can upload your questions and then they will be moderated back at base and they'll be filed up on my right hand side here. And I'll ask them at about um, 40, 45 minutes into our conversations and then before that, the arc of our conversation is going to be talking to Marina Abramovich about her career, where gender has fitted into her career and what, what, what that has meant within those works. And then Marina Ruiz will come in and bring in aspects of the sale and artists within the sale, which sort of chime with some of the themes that Marina's been um, exploring within her work over the last, well, 50, 50 years. So Marina Abramovich, let's go back to the 70s. Let's go back to a, a very early work called Incision, uh, 1978, I think. You're working, 1978, I think you're working, you're working with Ulai, okay, um, your, your art partner and your life partner for, for many years. And one of the things I think that you, you and Ulai were trying to uh, explore and to a certain extent undermine were concepts around gender. Yeah, this, was, I, this is the work that I really chose for this conversation because it's interesting work because it deals really with the male and female and, and in performance situation. Uh, work is very simple. Uh, Ulai is tied with the rope, uh, the, the, the rubber rope, and he's naked and he's going to the wall and he's splashing his body on the wall. And this is kind of painful experience and he's going all the time up and down and back to the wall. At the same time, I'm standing dressed, not naked, in exactly on the most, the farthest expansion that he can reach and doing absolutely nothing. So the entire public uh, emotions are torn to Ulai they re and they hate me because I'm just observing poor men suffering. But they don't know that we actually organized this, that in the same time, I don't know when, the character champion will come and actually throw me on the floor with the both legs in my chest. And I'm waiting for that. So my position is, is very tense, but the public doesn't know. And all the feelings are to Ulai. And when this attack comes, you know, I'm thrown on the floor. And somehow the emotions of the public, they are happy that actually I have been punished and nobody come to help me. And at the same time, I take my old energy and you know, strength and go back to the same position. But now the whole situation has changed because of that activity of, the, of the being, you know, being disbalanced, actually the emotions have been divided. And then after the, the situation is, when performance is finished, uh, we confront the public and we told them that all things was arranged and the public got incredibly angry because they were playing with their emotions. But at the same time, the question is, nobody come to help me. So it's a very interesting kind of work, you know, talking about male-female interaction with the public. And the way you're dressed in that piece, Marina, you know, in, in trousers, slacks and a shirt, slightly androgynous, is that on purpose? Absolutely. First of all, there are two reasons. One reason, we live in the car. We didn't have any money at all. So I was mostly wearing the same clothes. So this is same trousers all I will wear and same shirt he will, I will wear. So we, it was really also practical reason. But at the same time, I want something neutral, something really like, you know, man-like. 
And, and the karate kick, I mean, it, it, does, he, does he whack you for real? Very real. And he, oh, he, yeah, it looks he like was, it. He was, actually, he was a champion of karate in, in Austria. And this exhibition, this whole performance happened in Graz. And he really went with all force, with no mercy, and knocked me out. It was pretty hardcore. The, 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 the attack and all this time I've been really waiting for this attack to happen and it was very important that I didn't see attacker because I didn't tense my body, I didn't know when and you know it was pretty kind of shocking performance. It's, it's shocking now all these years later. What was the response back in 78? As I said, the public was angry because we manipulated them, because they were thinking that the, 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 the karate person was just a normal person from the public who had been irritated by my non-activity, and he just came to, you know, to, to, to attack me. But still, you know, the, the, the question was why the public doesn't help? Why? What is, the, right. what is the, actually the, the border when the performance become life and when really stops becoming life and when you, when you can really do the action or not? And this was many questions in, in many of my performances when I actually expose in Rhythm Zero is another work that public can actually, you know, take much more advantage of me than, than this one. Yes, we'll talk about that in a minute. That's an extraordinary work. But on, on this work, on, on Incision, how would it have been different conceptually if it had been the other way around? If, if you had been um, running towards Ulai, who was dressed and you were naked? Who knows? I have no idea, you know. <laughs> did you explore <laughs> that? Did, 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 you, did, you think, did you talk about that way around? We had a, we had another performance, but actually, you know, it was the other way around with rest energy. When we had Boinaro and it's facing my heart, not facing Ulai heart. So we explored these possibilities of changing, you know, the the, the, the danger in the gender situation. Yeah, and Marina Ruiz, within within the, the sale, what what works do you have that sort of speak to this issue of exploring gender? Well, I think. The in a way, a lot of the works in the sale explore gender. Um, but I also think, and there, there was something that um, Marina said, and it's about perception and how the public perceived um, the relationship uh, between her and Ulai and the violence that he was suffering. Um, and the, the work that we're seeing now by Rachel, Rachel Roish um, really doesn't really have much to do in terms of uh, performative uh, action. It is an old master. Um, but I found it very interesting in the sense that um, the perception that the public have of her, um, she, in her lifetime, she was incredibly successful. And, um, you know, she was uh, in very high demand. Her works commanded very high prices. Um, she was uh, considered one of the best uh, painters of still life of her of her time um, but it has been only very recently uh, that one of her works has been hung in the main gallery at the Rijksmuseum among her peers uh, so I think history has a tendency of um, changing the perception and the kind of the, the perceived value of certain artists and mm, not uh, very unluckily, um, women haven't been uh, in an advantageous position uh, throughout history. And I think her, Rachel Roish is a, is a great example of this. She's a, she's a br brilliant artist. And another artist who also um, suffered because of this was Francois Guido, Gido, sorry. Um, and you know how she's often referred to as Picasso's partner, Picasso's muse, mm. um, but she was an artist in her own right. And we have this incredible, really impressive painting um, of her daughter Paloma. And uh, this work in particular is, is quite interesting because she had been signed um, by Henry Kahnweiler and um, she felt much more independent and she felt much more secure. And you can actually feel it in the painting. Um, there is a sort of force and energy about it. The, the size of the painting is also bigger. She felt uh, that she could explore this bigger size. Um, and the subject matter is very personal, but there is a certain boldness about it. Um, and I think, 
again, she has been written about and uh, spoken about as someone else's muse. Um, but she she is uh, her own person and she, she was an artist. And I think that often is forgotten, um, which is quite interesting um, to compare with performance and, and the way female artists are sometimes perceived. How... how far along the road are we, Marina Ruiz, in, in this process of uncovering lost uh, or underappreciated female artists? Are, I mean, are we halfway along it? Are we nearly at the end? I mean, you think about Hilma Cliff, you think about Artemisa Gentileschi, uh, Berta Morisot, who was well known, but in hardly any collections, although you, you have her in a sale, don't you? Um, I mean, how far along the road are we? Are, are we expecting lots more discoveries? And, and almost to the point where we could see the canon rebalanced to something approaching 50-50? The hope is that, um, that yes, it will be rebalanced at some point. I, I do think that things are much better um, and there has been uh, an intention and a, a want to discover, rediscover rather, uh, a lot of artists. There's certainly a lot of interest, what we can see from the auction house um, in work in works by female artists. And slowly we're seeing them gain a bit of terrain when it comes to auction prices and demand and the amount of women that we're able to uh, find and offer in our sales. Uh, but I do feel there's still quite a lot of ground to cover, um, which is why we're having this conversation and why we put this all together. Absolutely. So, wait, wait, wait. I want to say something. <laughs> I need to say something about that. You know, unfortunately, in my life experience, I never saw good exhibition, important exhibition of female art or the feminist art that is a part of history of, of the of contemporary art. I never saw it. And I and, and this is really the huge problem. It's not that there are many there are not many good artists, but this exhibition has never taken been serious and never been curated well. And there was always few good artists and many, many bad artists. So that gives this kind of feeling that was not important. And this has become mm. like a, you know like you 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 put yourself in the box, you know, female box or, or the, the, the feminist box. I always I always want you to have to be the part of the exhibition with, with them equal with the, with the male. Yes. So what exhibition I would you like to see, Marina? I want to be, you know, another problem is the percentage. I think that we are doing very wrong about percentage. You're creating exhibition and then you have to know how many percentages black African artists, how many percentages transgender, how many percentages of women artists, how many percentages are, 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 are the, the, the male artists. Again, we are doing wrong. We have to look into quality. We have to look into great work. We have to, you know, it's not just good to make something which is okay or good. It's not enough that something is just great. We have to make the work with wow, with something like when you look and say, wow, that, and this is female artist and is wow. And that we, 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 we have this kind of work. We have to research, we have to work harder, and we have to be able to make this kind of exhibitions. Full of male, full of female, full with transgenders, full of everybody, but really great work. The content is important. We always forget the content. We should not go on percentage. We should go on content. Yes, but I guess... I, I totally agree, um, but I do feel that the balance hasn't been quite equal, where there have been historically a lot of women who are brilliant and who have produced really fantastic work of great quality, but who haven't been exhibited, who haven't been written about, which is in a way why we do need these exhibitions now of amazing women um, of, you know, of the Hilma F. Klimt when her exhibition in New York was a huge revelation for so many people. And, you know, she has been around, she had been around for a long time. And it was the first time many people were seeing her work. Um, and this happens with, with many other artists. When we had the exhibition at the, at the National Gallery here uh, with Artemisia Gentileschi, it was a revelation for so many people. But, you know, she was working centuries ago. Um, and I do think there is some ground to cover there. Wilma Klimt herself forbid to show her work after her death 50 years later. So this is why we have Wilma Klimt now. 
she really didn't let her work be shown 50 years after her death. This was in her testament. Yeah, it was. It's absolutely true. Okay, Marina, let's go back to Marina Abramovich, back to your career, back to 1977. And one of my uh, favourite works by you, which is Imponderabilia, which is just, well, I just think it's funny as well as just is a great bit of work, but it's very mischievous. But it, it brings up the, the, the question of the female naked body. Uh, and and in, in Ponderbilia, both you and Ulai are naked. We'll see the video in a, in a minute. Here it is. But what does it, what does it mean? How, what does it mean to be a, a naked female artist compared to a naked male artist back then or even now? The, the, the woman using her body in her art. We didn't do this because we are male or female artists. Our, our idea was completely different. We were invited for the, to show the performance art in the performance festival in the museum in Bologna. So what we were thinking, you know, if there are no artists, there will not be museums. So why we are not the door of the museum? It's a very poetical piece. And to be the door of the museum, we are working together. So one is male, one is female. And to be naked is to be vulnerable and to be totally open. So we made the door of the museum smaller so that actually public could not go frontally, but they have to turn left or right side in order to face male or female. And we had a secret camera, and the secret camera was showing when you go to the floor, to the upper floor, actually with the choice you made. And uh, it was so interesting how many choices was made male or female. And uh, on, the, on the end of the six hours, the police came and because we was naked and, was, and they asked us for our documents, for passports, which we didn't have. And then the police actually chose to face me one by one and forbid the show. But I think that time was really, we are talking 70s. It was such an easy thing to be naked. It, the performance artists in those days, you know, or they're naked or they're dressed in a dirty black or dirty white. This was the, this was the, 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 the dress code in those days. I didn't feel especially that I'm female and naked. I just feel, you know, artists like a sculpture in the space and, you know, and being the door of the museum was a very poetical gesture. In this snapshot we've seen in that video, Marina, there's two observations I make. One is the majority of people passed with their, their, their bodies faced to you. Uh, and, and also, nobody, nobody said anything to either you or Ulai. They just walked straight through. Without, they were kind of embarrassed. It was, at first, <coughs> they was embarrassed. Then everybody absolutely um, didn't want to face our eye, to have any eye contact. Many of us stopped on our feet, which was very painful. And uh, <laughs> the, few people, the few people actually, you know, face Ulai, but actually with the body face me. And, uh, and, and it was really um, interesting that lack of contact, because they, they could not deal with that, that the actually proximately of the two naked body, two artists in that way. We, we create very vulnerable situation for the audience and for ourselves. Yes, it's absolutely brilliant and brilliant conceptual work. But do you do you think within it, Marina? I mean, I know you say you know it's easy. You know, everybody in the seventies, people were taking their clothes off willy nilly. It was fine. But nevertheless, it's a naked female and a naked male. Do you think people perceive the naked body of of the gender and make different decisions and respond in a different way? Yeah, they did, but that was not my problem. I, I we give them the work, and the, the work can be interpreted in many different ways. It's not my responsibility. Mm. But how did you read how they reacted? I never count how many people face me or how many people face face Ulai. <laughs> to me, it was very important that work was done well, and uh, and and to have such a huge impact. And this work we reperform also in many different museums with the reperformance in performing, and we change the gender. We had now because it's 21st century. We have two men in the door. We have two women in the door, and we have men and female. So we have all these possibilities. Different why did you why why did you change it, Marina? Because it's the 21st century. Because the, the all opening to gender is different, you know. And I think it's very important to actually accept also possibility to have a two men and two women at the same time and make this kind of choices, which is not made by gender, but is made by the, you know, whatever, look, feeling, smell, intuition, whatever. Yeah. 
So this issue of, of gender and, and, and the naked body, Marina Ruiz, uh, what's your reflections on that? Um, I, I think um, it's super interesting because um, I feel like we're much more used to seeing the naked female body historically. Um, it has been de depicted uh, in art history, and I think it is something that we have become used to. And um, there have been depictions of the idealized female body. Um, and there are many different artists who have explored this and who have done this in very different ways. So, for example, Jenny Savile, um, we have this amazing little portrait, um, self-portrait from 1992, which is an incredibly early work. And she had been to Cincinnati the year before and had done some theoretical studies. And actually she, she had realized how women had, had been, um, hadn't been represented in art history as creators as much as um, they should have. And she then started painting the, the year after. And she that's when she creates her incredibly famous paintings um, from the, the 90s, which were then uh, purchased by Charles Saatchi and um, exhibited in Sensation. This is a little study. Um, it's very similar to the, the heads in Propped and Branded. And um, the, the use here, the use of her body, um, where she's looking at herself, but she's also very fearlessly not idealizing her body. Um, I feel is super uh, brave, but it's it's quite revolutionary in a way, um, where you know we're used to um, to looking at slim and very well built figures, and she's actually enjoying the flesh and just the the kind of just the size of it. Um, and, you know, th this is, is just a small detail of, of a face, uh, but you can already see the enjoyment uh, in the paint and, and the way she's building it up. Um, and in the larger portraits, you can obviously see the whole bodies and they, they're, um, they're actually, uh, they, they, there's so much flesh and so much um, volume in them. Uh, they, they're amazing. And there's been other artists who've done this. So Tracy Emin obviously has used her body throughout her career. Um, this is a, a, a nude body, again, something that we're used to seeing in a very idealized form. But this is a very sexualized way of presenting the female body. Um, it's not even a very flattering angle, uh, which is, again, very interesting for, for an artist to do this. And then there's artists uh, like Natalia LL, um, who we also have in the cell. And this is an interesting work because it's also from the 70s. So she was working at a similar time as, as you, Marina. And um, she was using, these are close-ups of, of her face, but she was actually using her own body to reflect on consumption and how the media viewed the female form as this kind of selling mechanism. Um, so it, it, this act of simply eating a banana turns into this hypersexualized um, image or, or series of images um, that are extremely new and, you know, in the 70s, um, kind of uh, revolutionary, not revolutionary, but, you know, out there. Um, so, so it is quite interesting, I think, female artists, um, to explore their own bodies and the female body in relationship to the viewer and uh, to see how the viewer reacts uh, is, is fascinating. Marina must have been... Abramish, what did, did you, did you know many of these other female artists working at the time? I knew Natalia personally because she came from, um, from, uh, the, uh, she, from Poland uh, to mm. Apple Gallery in uh, in Holland and the performance there. And Apple Gallery was at that time the only gallery in all Europe doing performance work. So I met her several times. I, I knew Valley Export, I knew Natalia in those days was really a great artist working at the same time. And was it hard as women? To, sorry. Yeah, as women, was it hard in the in the seventies to be doing things like this? Was it a new thing for the public? Was it viewed differently as your male counterparts? 
I think when you ask this question Americans, they will tell you a completely different story. If you ask Brit mm. British artists, they will tell you a different story. But I come from communism. I come from ex-Yugoslavia. It was not difficult for me at all. I was a warrior. I was doing this thing, and I was, it, was, it was impossible actually doing that in, in, in that time. I was against my, my family, against my professor for art, against my, my, my country, you know, the, the, the art criticism. Everybody was thinking that's not art at all. So mm -hmm. some of my historical pieces that are now part of history at that time was absolutely, you know, put in, it, it was ridiculous. I, I just had this vision that what I'm doing, I'm right. And this gives me strength. So I didn't look if it was male or female or I'm, because it's difficult for what I, I'm female artists to do these things. I've just been doing them. I was like a, like a bulldozer <laughs> and, and I was only occupied and focused on this. This is the reason I didn't want to have children. This is the reason I didn't want to have family. I just don't want to do the, my work. And regardless, you know, what the male was doing around me, I was not affected at all. <laughs> Marina, in those early years, how important was Ulai to the, the, the development of you as an artist and how important were you to his development as an artist? But first of all, when I met Ulai, I already had performance art history behind yeah. me and I was yeah. already working in the museums, working on the festivals and I was really exploring, going really to the physical mental limits of my work. And when I met him, uh, you know, when I met him, Ulai had a half face painted as a woman and half face as a man. Yeah. So he was male and female at the same time. It would really attract me very much. And we met on our birthday. And, and we decided to work together because basically I didn't need to be male anymore and female. And he didn't need to be male and female. We could both actually explore our own gender into something we call the third dimension. We call that self not female, not male, but like a third element, third existence, which is that self, which is a mix of these two energies. And we explore this in, in, in many performances. So in, in, in my case, when I met Ulai, my suitcase to come to relationship was performance. His suitcase to come to his relationship was not much performance, but more photography. So we merged yeah. these two elements together and we create all this work together till the Great Wall of China separates us. I remember that. We'll talk about that in a minute. It's a lovely story. But, but let's just talk about light, dark Amsterdam. And it's, it's interesting that you talk about Ulai coming from a photography background because the images you created, they're, they are, they're very sort of powerful. I mean, the, 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 not just the performance, but the actual image. But one of the things which seems to be a consistent of your work, which is in, in this piece as well, is the, is the drama of duration that you, you, you make it uncomfortable for people because you just go on a bit too long. What is, it about, what is it about duration you want to explore? It was very important in our performance, every element and minimally, to be minimal as possible. In this case, light dark. We took our bodies like a drummer. We actually was making music, but at the same time we were slapping each other. We both was dressed almost in very similar clothes, and we wanted to go as fast as we can go with the slapping, till the, actually we could not do any more. And this is the duration was actually the result of, of, of the action. So sometimes the pieces are shorter, sometimes longer, but mostly we like long work. We like to explore the limits of physical and mental body as, as long as we can. And then, you know, to actually open consciousness in, in, in a different way. Because these kind of experiences are very profound. And every performance actually changes in a certain way. So this so, piece so when you, you see is light dark. Yeah. It's called light dark. <laughs> light dark, yeah, yeah. It was in that, yeah. But when you and do just, a, just, a work... I, Wait, 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 wait. I want to just say one more <laughs> important thing. This piece yeah. looks so aggressive and so violent. But at the same time, when we finished this work, each of us, because we only slap one side of the face, each of us was like, like literally Eve Klein blue. The face, and we walk <laughs> on the street totally in love because we, we didn't have any aggression in our relationship at that time. Everything was in performance. But with, with, that, with that performance, do you encounter that? You know what's going to happen. You've, you've decided what's going to happen between the two of you. Do, is there a nervousness? Because it, as you say, you want to take it to, to the limits. You want to take it to the point of exhaustion or, or, or to a point where you don't know how it's going to end. So is that a, a difficult and nervous place to start? 
The nervous start before, before performance, before any performance I've been doing, even now, even if I do the lecture, even if I'm talking to you now, I'm incredibly mm -hmm. nervous before. But the moment you stand in the front of the public, it's all this nervousness disappear. You enter into another space and time, and you actually, you know, you, you, you leave behind you your little poor self, and you actually perform from your higher self. And that higher self can do anything. And was humour an element of your work, Marina? Did you, did you think, did you, did, what did you, was there an element of humour in your work? Because obviously it looks aggressive and it looks a little violent, but I, did, I know you and, and there, is, there, there is just this little, this little, little seed of humour in everything you do, I think. I have the, I, I do the humour. There is a lots of, actually there's some pieces people don't know so much, but there is a piece called Balkan Erotic Epic, which is so funny. I mean, it's really <laughs> hysterically funny. So sometimes I, when I do very difficult and heavy piece, I need to do something light and, and something funny. And people don't know this aspect of me, but they know me in private life. I'm the, the worst dirty, you know, and, and how you call uh, dirty joke teller. I, but right now, because of, the, of this, uh, you know, correctness, I can't say anything anymore. It sucks. No. And does it affect art? Uh, you know, I really think that the, the correctness, if you imagine all what we've been doing in the 70s, right now, in these circumstances where we are now, nothing will be possible, nothing. I think the incredibly important works of art they made in the 70s and 80s and 90s, they're not actually possible because of that correctness. It's really actually the, the damage, the creativity in a really bad way. That's extraordinary. So do you think some of your works you would not be able to make today? Never, absolutely never. It would be, it would be immediately abandoned, you criticized, whatever, you know. But whatever problems I had in the 70s, I've done them anyway. So if I have the idea of the work, no matter what kind of criticism I get, I would do it anyway. Because, you know, as an artist, you have to be a warrior. Yeah. But you, you think there's a sort of a, a creeping dogma in today's society, which is becoming, you know, like, like the thought police and, then, and just incredibly limiting. It's terrible. It's really terrible. It's, it's just, I don't know, I, even the COVID situation with COVID right now, people are so afraid to be alone. They're so afraid of loneliness. They're so afraid of, 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 of having, you know, less this, of consumption. They're so afraid of, of, of not having anything in the agenda. But this is such a creative moment that actually you can really rethink about your life and, and understand, you know, what it's all about. And so when you when you're doing your new work for 2023 at the Royal Academy, are you going to be tackling some of this? Are you going to be tackling what I suppose you might call political correctness? I don't care about political correctness. <laughs> I don't give a shit about political correctness. I really don't. And anyway, my show in 2023 is supposed to be in 2020, but because of COVID being postponed. So I basically never been more ready for one show in my life. I had the catalog ready, I had the work ready, I had the crates ready. So now I have two years more, so I have more time to create. Marina Ruiz, um, what, 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 what thoughts have you got on this issue of um, political correctness and, and it limiting the voice of all artists, male and female? Mm. I think um, I do agree with Marina that a lot of the works she did in the 70s, a lot of the works that were made in the 70s probably wouldn't be possible today. I do also think that they are necessary they were necessary at the time, and um, they reflected a particular moment in time. I've, I've always been in a, a believer in the fact that art reflects the times we live in. And um, I guess that that is also seen nowadays, but we are addressing different issues. We are seeing um, works that uh, tackle racial issues, that tackle um, gender issues and tackle um you know sexual orientation issues and they they do it in a different way perhaps uh, maybe not a kind of performance open way but we do i think we do see um artists express themselves and express the things that worry them and that um, preoccupy them in different ways 
Okay. Okay, uh, Marina Abramovich, let's go to Triple uh, A. Um, do you call it Triple A or do you call it AAA? AAA, -A -A, not Triple A. AAA. -A -A. Just three sorry, times sorry. A, yeah. I just keep <laughs> just treating it like a battery, whatever next. So, yeah, AAA. -A -A. And, and this is the two, the work where you and Ulai scream at each other very close up. And I suppose the question I've got for that within the context of this conversation about female artists is, do you think that when a female artist is making an expressive piece of work, an expressionistic piece of work, a piece of work which is, you know, delivering an emotion, that it gets treated differently than when a male artist is making an expressive work of art? Yeah, they do. But this again, the problem with the criticism, really, but not about intention. I mean, this mm. AA piece it was really very simple again. We scream in the top of our lungs till one of us lose the voice. <laughs> and uh, this, and I lost voice for one month. He didn't. That's it. So, That's the piece. Because you were so screaming harder? No, I, I don't know. You look the video, you make, you make, you, you, you make your, your comments. I don't want to say anything, but it was very interesting when you scream and you let the voice go, how this voice change. It was such interesting to observe that in the beginning that is just the voice that you know, and then become the voice you don't know. They become the voice of angry child, the voice of, of, the, of the hysterical voice, the, vo the voice of the bird, the voice of the animal, the voice they come the voices that you never actually heard in your life. It's a very interesting piece and it's very sculptural. Two voices actually, you know, kind of confronting each other. So Marina, when you're making these works, um, are you making them principally for yourself or are you making them for an audience or are you making them for posterity? What, what, what's, what's the motivation for them? I never make performance for myself or in a studio without public. For me, the public is essential. All these works are actually made for the public. And the public and the performer actually complete the work together by watching it. And uh, these performances are different ideas of relationship. Uh, you know, the, I, I, as I said before, we are talking about male and female energy and how the male and female energy can be interpreted in many different ways. And we explore all possibilities. As being male and female, I've been, I've been in the relationship and being an artist. So we are kind of perfect example of these two genders working together till we separate. Absolutely. And part of that working together, of course, is conceiving the idea. Was that something which is, you know, you, 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 you develop together or did one of you have a brainwave and pitch it to the other? How did that creative process work? It's very important that we actually never reveal who, from who idea come from. We put the two ideas together and we start very complicated and then we develop simplicity, simplicity, simplicity and how we can say things with very simple things. I mean, this is like, you know, two people screaming, one person slapping, breathing in and breathing out from each other's mouths. I mean, the pieces are almost sculptures in the space, but they're living sculptures. And, uh, and the, the work is very important to be seen as a unit and not as a, you know, two different units. One unit, one idea, mixed together. Would you ever work with a, a, a performing partner again in the way you did with Ulai? I, I done some works with a different, uh, you know, artist. I done with Jan Faber one work. I done yeah. the, the two, the ballet, ballet piece at an opera with the Mianjale mm. and Rabri Chakrawi. But always this was just one project at a time. I would never consider long duration performance uh, collaboration. But one, you know, at a time collaboration to me is incredibly inspiring. And it's a great to work with different artists, but just for all one project at a time. Sure. Uh, uh, Marina Ruiz, um, this idea of, of expressiveness and when a, a, a female artist is expressing herself compared to when a male artist is, is expressing himself and how that is, is read differently, perhaps, by, by society. Is there, is, is there something in that or not? Yeah, I think so. Um, and I do feel that um, we often ascribe a lot of feelings and emotions to artworks made by women, which sometimes are completely fair. And that is what the artist was trying to express. But in a lot of 
occasions. Um, you know, we have a fabulous Barbara Hepworth, um, but we also have a, 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 an amazing uh, Bridget Riley, who, um, you know, she was a colorist. She is a colorist, sorry. Um, but when we talk about colorists, um, we we don't talk about her, for example. We, we, we refer to the Joseph Alberts and, you know, the, the kind of um, the color field. Field out of Matisse, you know, and and we talk about um, prim primarily male figures, um, and I I do think there is a tendency to ascribe a lot of feeling and emotion to what women do when sometimes it is true, and uh, in other occasions it isn't. Uh, it's just they are artists; they're interested in a material like uh, Barbara Hedworth in, in this particular work. She hand hammered um, the the metal. And there's this uh, amazing patina, and you know that's what she was trying to do. She was just exploring the form and the the kind of um, negative and positive um, uh, space with the with the perforations and the the um, oxidation of the material, um, and that's what they should be uh, appreciated as as amazing creators. Yeah. Um, Marina, I know. Wait, uh, I have to. Say, I have to say something. Wait, wait, wait. Yes, wait, I have to say something. Please, please. <laughs> I know. I know. Now I can tell you what's the difference between male and female artists. Yes. Are you interested? Yes. The difference yes. is, you have male artists, which is a fantastic, great artist. You know, sitting in his studio all night, and you know, can't go home because the work is so important. And the, <laughs> his wife come and bring him hot soup, and nourish him and that he can continue working. Female artist, great artist, sit in the studio all night. There is no male bringing the soup. This is the difference. Yes. That's a very that's, big difference. A good one, yeah. No soup. <laughs> even now, Marina, even now, you don't have anybody to bring you soup. I bet you do. <laughs> OK, now a little bit better. But no soup. Generally, <laughs> for many years, 50 years of my career, no soup. For real. Marina, can we just go back again with your, your career and, and this another underlying theme? I'm thinking about Rest Energy, which was that extraordinary work where you, you um, Ulai is holding a bow, an arrow, uh, and you're holding the bow, he's holding the string, the arrow is pointed at your heart. I'm also thinking about um, Rhythm Zero. And there's this theme, this recurring theme with you of of, of, of risk and of violence. Is this, is this, is this about theater? There's no theater. There's nothing theatrical no. here. There, my heart is real and Iro is real. And if right. you lose the balance, I can be killed. So that's not the theater. In the theater, the, you know, the blood is ketchup and the knife is no real knife. This is all real here. But the important this piece was, you know, when the, the Ulai been ask why is facing you know, her heart and not his heart. And he answered, this is my heart too. That was his answer. Beautiful answer. Ula, Ula is not with us anymore and I would like to say what he said at that time. This piece is extremely short. It's the shortest performance in our life. It's four minutes and 30 seconds. For me, it was lifelong. The lifelong. And, and this... only the, yeah. Oh. No, carry on. No, I, we just had a small microphone, so now heart, that you can hear the heartbeat and how the heart changed the beat as the adrenaline rushing into our, you know, into our body. But this notion of putting yourself in an incredibly vulnerable position, so you're very vulnerable there. And if we think about rhythm zero, where you have people can do whatever they wish to you, there is a table of items they can pick up. On that table is a gun, on that table is a bullet somebody can put a gun in a bullet and shoot you, which very nearly happened. There's a razor they can cut you with. What, is, what, is, what are you exploring with this notion of, of violence? But this was, you know, every performance has their history and why it was made. And that's very important yeah. to see that the background. In this background, I'm 23 years old. I've been so fed up with the, with the public criticism on performance, how this is a masochism, how this is bullshit, how this is not art, and how the, you know, we are doing all this crazy stuff. So I say, okay, I'm not doing absolutely nothing. I am standing in the gallery still, 
you have 72 objects on the table of the public and six hours to do whatever you want on me. I take all responsibility, including killing me, because there was a bullet and a, and a pistol. And public, you know, took this advantage. And on the end of the performance, I knew a public could kill. And this was the very big lesson for me. So it was not me doing something. It was public doing to me. And how long was the duration of the piece? Where So I assume, I'm just, I'm just guessing hours. that it's people. So people started polite and then they got worse and worse? Yeah, it was a full six hours of the, of the experience. And, you know, in the beginning, people come, you know, for the opening with their wives. And one reason why I was not raped, because there was there as a normal opening with the wives. But at the same time, the woman will tell the men what to do. And, uh, and they will only take my tears off with the handkerchief. This was my experience mm. in this piece. And, and it was six were you hours. Frightened? I finished too. I, I, you know, this was the piece that you have to put yourself in a state of mind. Otherwise, you know, you could not do it. And I remember when the six hours was over and I, the galleries came to me and they said six hours is over. I started walking towards the public and everybody ran away. Nobody wants to yeah. confront me, me as me, just the runway. Yeah, yeah. And how, 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 when somebody loaded that pistol, and they did, how yeah, frightening was, was that? The, yeah. <laughs> it was very frightening. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, when you're in the performance state, you're, you're in a different state of mind, you know? Otherwise, you could not do it. So I, I got frightened later, after performance is finished, not during. Okay. The jury, after I was trembling. Have, have any of your works actually given you a post-traumatic post stress syndrome? Have you, anything you've done actually affected you in later life? No, it makes me stronger. Absolutely stronger. Oh. Interesting. Because I really got consciously there into the work. And this yeah. piece was very interesting because this is an example of so many years ago that I give the public all the all the actually rights to do whatever they want. Then came much later on the piece, Artist is Present, where I actually give public only one thing to do, and this is to sit on the chair and engage and gaze with me. And everything else was restricted, but they can stay as long as they want. And this was totally different, different feeling. One was a feeling of aggression, and this was feeling of emotion and, and, uh, and uh, acceptance. Well, you, I mean, the Artist is, is Present is one of the great works of the 21st century, I'd say. Absolutely extraordinary. Thank you. Thank but what was impossible to predict, it must have been impossible for you as well, Marina, is the public reaction. You know, I, the, the, the Klaus Biesenbach, the, the curator, said to me, if you do this piece in New York, nobody have time. Nobody will sit on this chair ever. The chair will be empty. And the chair was never empty. I really did the risk and I actually, when during the work, I, I understood how incredible emotional work is and how incredible emotional response the public is. The public was sleeping outside of the museum, waiting to come mm -hmm. in. It was, it was just it, the people, you know, the most interesting to me was the 76 guards of the, keeping, you know, the, the museum guards of the museum who actually went home, take the uniform on the weekends and come back and wait for me to sit with me the guards of the museum. Yeah. This was to me like, oh my God, real acceptance that something was seriously going on. Oh, this is the moment with Ulay. I know, this is a very special moment. Tell us about this. So I invite him as a guest of honor for the show and I have no idea that he will sit and, you know. So when he came to sit, you know, all the rules I had in my life, you know, that absolutely no contact with the public, only the gays fall off because, you know, he was my life. It was like all life went through, through me. And that was the work that really went so emotional. I, 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 uh, I, I will never forget this moment. And this is interesting no. that, on the, that now on the YouTube, this, this moment, which is only a few seconds, I don't know, three minutes, have 17 million followers. <laughs> People identified of, emotion, of the emotions of that moment because it's real. You know, you can't fake such a stuff. When stuff is real, touch people's heart. When was the, when, when was the time b before you, you met Ulai there again? When, when did you, had you seen him last? 
I see him last in upstate New York when he came to visit me with his wife, Elena, and mm. we was making the, the video about our, you know, the, the, how you, the stories that we never told to anybody. And later on, he, you know, he got sick and last year he passed away. Yes, I only talked to him on the sad. phone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you think this is your greatest work of art? No, because I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> you no. wait till the RA in 2023, right? Yeah, but I want to wait a bit. But I want to read you something. Can I? Please. This is something that I find recently. And this is really somehow really talk to me. First, they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. Then they fight you. And then you win. This is Gandhi. There you go, Marina. Great Gandhi. That, that's, that's perfect. Let me go to um, uh, Marina Ruiz on that. And that, that, that Gandhi thought. Um, I mean, in, in, in a way, that's what your show is about, isn't it? This yeah. is the, the final yeah. part of that. Eventually, you know, the, 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 the people who had been marginalized, um, ignored, not given a voice, they're Loud. getting a voice, right? Exactly. Um, yes, and we, we feel that um, we are in a very privileged position and it is partly our duty to provide a platform um, to certain voices who maybe haven't been um, shown in the light that they should. Um, this is the Riley that I was talking about earlier. Um, and yeah, but this, this is exactly the point of this auction. And if we can contribute a little bit um, in this in this fight or battle, um, we'll be very happy. And I have to say, Marina, um, sorry, I just wanted to um, say about the, um, the artist is present. I actually remember being at the museum in, in back then in, in 2010 um, and seeing you, I, I wasn't able to sit on the chair, but the emotion in the room was just incredible. You could feel it as part of the, of the audience. And that, that was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Where does that, Marina, where does that come from? Where, where does that emotion come from? Is it, is it coming from you? Is it in the air? Is, is, it, is it art? I mean, where does it exist? You know, first of all, um, you give public possibility to actually have a relation one-to-one, -one, artist one-to-one, -one. but at the same time, the public, when they come to the person who come finally after waiting for a long time to sit on the chair, he is observed by the other public. He's observed by me. He's filmed by the camera. He's, he's photographed. There's nowhere to go except into himself. And the moment you go to himself and, and, and you know, engage and gaze with me, it's incredible. You're so vulnerable. I'm vulnerable. He's vulnerable. And all emotions come out. In New York is so much loneliness, so much pain, so much, so many things there, and everything comes out. And I make myself vulnerable. And that vulnerability creates trust with the public because they can, mm. you know, open to me. And the public open to me. Okay. So um, I haven't seen any qu questions. I know there's hundreds of them, but I think they might not have come through. Um, but that's okay because... <laughs> It's just so wonderful to talk to both the marinas, and we've got almost no time left. But there is one time, a bit of time, just to deal with the elephant in the room. Uh, and this is really for Mar um, Marina Ruiz, but I'm going to start with you, Marina Abramovich, which is um, the vulgar issue of money, in a way, that, that it seems to me that even in contemporary times, that female artists don't generate the same sort of... Um, uh, prices at auction as, as as male artists. I mentioned this to Rachel White Reed a little while ago, and she said, "Well, there you go. You're getting a bargain, then, aren't you?" But why is that? Do you think, Marina Abramovich? Now I really talk about male female again, back which I try <laughs> to avoid all the time. No, it's true. You know, it's huge injustice about the male and female artists. Male artists are more paid than female. You know, I mean, not just uh, in, in art, but in work, in working places, yeah, in questions. communities, everywhere. 
So this is such a very general question, what I think have to be corrected. But you know, in, and also in my case is very complicated because first of all, I choose performance art. Performance art is very difficult, you know, to actually put the price on it because it's yeah. immaterial form of art. But then I also produce photograph work. I produce objects, I produce video, I produce films. So there is a lots of actually things that I, you know, they can actually be sold. But at the same time, I never receive or reach the price of any of him, of male artists of, of my generation. That's the situation. I can't correct that. I don't know how I... Uh, we I, have to I, leave that to Marina Ruiz to sort out for you. Yes, Mar please, <laughs> somebody else. To Marina Ruiz, what, what, what's going on? Uh, and, and is it gonna change anytime soon? Or, is, or has the market got it right? No, I think, um, again, historically, um, there, we just, women, being offered at auction, for example, um, which is the, the area that I can talk about, um, it started much later. Um, auctions were generally dominated by uh, male artists. Um, so, you know, there was a, a lot of ground to, to recover. Um, it has certainly improved. We have seen um, average prices of, of works by women uh, increase in the last couple years in all categories. And we have certainly seen uh, a lot of more interest from collectors and museums um, in, in the work of by women. That said, I still think there's a lot of ground to cover. Um, someone like Cecily Brown, for example, um, with this amazing work from 1998, uh, who's priced at four to 600,000 pounds. And this is a really amazing, beautiful composition. You know, her record price is $6.8 million. If you look at her contemporaries and their record prices, they're really far away from her, um, you know. At, at a, if we look at a contemporary like Damien Hirst, um, who, started working more or less at the same time um, and you know in his record price and and that's much higher than her record price and that is definitely something that we hope will improve um, or someone like Mary Beale um, who we also have a, a work in the in the sale um, which you know it's estimated at 15 to 20 thousand pounds which is really low and her record price is a hundred and eighteen thousand dollars which again it's, it's, if you look at her contemporaries and other um, artists who were uh, painting portraits at the time, um, she was painting portraits, the prices they command at auction are much higher. Um, so there is definitely a question why and, and can we improve this? Um, I would say it is definitely some, uh, an area where um, collectors can find great works at great prices um, that they can add to their collections. Bert, Mor Bert Morisot, um, Again, her, her record price is slightly higher here. It's at $10.9 million. Um, but if we look at someone like Degas, um, whose record price is um, $37 million, you know, it, it, there's so much ground to be covered. So I, I do think it has improved, but um, there is a lot, a lot of work to do. And um, it's, it's a good thing. I think it, there's a, a positive. There, it means there is room to grow and there is... Um, the prices can still go up. They're not going to you, reach a ceiling. You have an Abramovich in this sale, right? We do have an Abramovich in this sale. Um, and it's, uh, as you mentioned, Marina, you do, do uh, make objects. Um, this is a self-portrait ahead um, in, uh, with a quartz crystal um, in the forehead. Um, and, you know, I, I, when we look at your prices, this amazing piece, which is, you know, the, the face, it's, it's so beautiful. And there's something very um, raw about it. There's a very raw energy about it. And it would be amazing to hear you talk about it if you, if you can. But I, I do believe that in general, um, the prices for your works are very low um, compared to the importance of your contribution uh, to art history. Marina, you, Marina Abramovich, you should have charged every one of those people at MoMA. You should, you should have charged them $50, $50 to sit with you. <laughs> that would have, I have no that would have comment been on this subject. No comment <laughs> on this subject. Marina, we've been allowed a couple of extra minutes. So would you, would you bear, could you bear to ask, answer a couple of questions? We've had hundreds, but we can answer, ask just, just a couple. The first is it's a rather lovely question for you, Marina Abramovich, which is what 
uh, is the human reaction that has surprised you most during a performance? Wow, that's a not easy question. No. I, wow. I don't know, you know, it's, it's I, I, when I perform, I'm so concentrated on delivering the, my maximum to the public so that I, in the same time, I could not actually be aware of reaction. I only can be aware of energy and I have mm. to feel energy in the room. That energy in the room is compact, strong and kind of fulfilling. Uh, I remember that it's so important for me, even I do the lecture and I see a person from the audience leave to go to the, maybe to toilet or to leave the room. I'm so worried if he's coming back, but sometimes basically they just go to the toilet and they come back and I'm okay. But generally, I really, it's, it's not about the individuals. It's about energy as, 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 a, as all. When you were doing Artist is, is Present, other than that sort of very famous moment with Ulai, was there any other person who sat on the other side of that table which made a connection which surprised you? Wow, you know, this is a long, long story and I have to write the book about it because there's so many different reactions that, 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 and the situations that people have. I, I, I had a difficult, I had a sometimes incredible difficult and negative energy and sometimes, sometimes really the more overwhelming to the tears energy. I remember the one energy that, uh, the, the, the one, I remember Patty Smith, you know, <laughs> wow. sit with me and she actually love all the time. This was the only person in the entire audience of how many, you know, thousands of people that love. And I, I was, and asked her after, you know, why she loved, she said she was incredibly uncomfortable. <laughs> And she could not really look at me in the eyes. And then it was another person, which was Tibetan Lama, who came on the end of the, of the, of the, uh, the, the last day. And he sat in the front of me. And he never looked at my eyes. He always looked above me, everything above me, around me. And I was thinking, I, then I asked him after the performance, you know, why he was looking above me and never at me. But he said, I was not looking at you. I was protecting you. Oh, wonderful. What, a, what, a, what an amazing thing to say. Marina, I've got another question for, um, for Marina Brambridge. Your work has an integrity through testing resilience and pushing boundaries. Julie Meretu once said that borders are meant to be trespassed. Do you think women have to, women artists, I assume, have to trespass more boundaries than men and disrupt expectations as a result? I think that the women generally, the incredible, powerful human beings, and as an artist, they are unstoppable. I really believe that just the fact that you can create life in your body, it's such a power. And this is mostly why the men are so afraid of us, but we can do anything. And we, it, this, I really believe in the energy and, and wisdom and incredible strengths of the women and artists. With that in mind, too. with that in mind, Maureen uh, Ruiz, um, another question, and this is for you, how can we give equal opportunities to female and male young artists so that gender representation in exhibitions does not matter anymore? I think um, the very important actors in, in, in this are galleries. Um, so I, I, they are the most important um, players in the, in the kind of the network in the art world to represent artists um, so I think um, galleries with programs uh, that allow both female and male and transgender and non-binary artists um, to uh, show their work is incredibly important at the moment and um, you know that, that's the first step and then visibility in museums um, writing articles writing books about them and then that's how that eventually translates into auction and prices um you know where we look at galleries we look at exhibitions we look at what's being written what's being shown out there uh, so i think the first step is um is that to to be shown yeah. and to so be that, that's a point of discovery really isn't it the, mm -hmm. the point of discovery yeah yeah okay. So the marinas, that's it. We've overrun by 10 minutes. Viewers, I hope that's okay. I think what a wonderful discussion, what incredible insights to 
let's be honest, one of the greatest living artists in the world at present has been present with us. And it's been a thrill, Marina Abramovich. Thank you very much. Uh, and Marina Ruiz, thank you very much. Your insights and, uh, and, and thoughts from the other side of the process, the curatorial, curatorial side has been wonderful as well. So thank you both very much indeed. It's been our privilege. Um, and and to Sotheby's Contemporary Conversations. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And you, it was wonderful. And we, we love your top, Marina Abramovich, by the way. We think it's a great, uh, we love the orange top. <laughs> that I was looking for what to do, how to <laughs> create color impact. You created it perfectly. Thank you. thank you very much. And thank you very much, everybody, for, for watching this, 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 this broadcast, this webinar. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Thank you and good night. <laughs>